Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Talon's webinar on cloud data architectures. My name is Alison Reed, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to my colleagues from the international team of Talon, Nicolas Cambonin, Global Director of Data Consulting and Technology Services, and Ibrahim Safiedin, Senior Architect and Technical Lead. This morning, Nicolas and Ibrahim will be sharing with you the latest data trends, some concrete use cases, and an in-depth look at the components of the five principal cloud data architectures on the market today. While we're waiting for a few more of our participants to connect, uh, a few housekeeping items to help you get started. We've reserved time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session, so feel free to use the question function on the right-hand side of your screen to send us your questions and to limit the data usage necessary for all of us to connect remotely. We're going to be turning off our webcams uh, during the presentation and we'll come back to you at the end of the Q&A session. So for those of you who don't know Talon, Talon is an international IT consulting firm. For more than 15 years, Talon has been advising and supporting its clients in implementing digital transformation and organization projects. We do this by using our technical skill set in areas such as smart automation, RPA, artificial intelligence, data, and blockchain technology. And we're doing this for clients in a large variety of sectors. Talon's origins are resolutely French and our headquarters are in Paris, France, but Talon has grown to be an international group and is now present on four continents. We're pleased to um, see many participants this morning from different countries, including Switzerland, UK, France, Italy, Luxembourg, amongst others. And this morning, Nicolas and Ibrahim are joining us from Talon in Switzerland, and I'm here with Talon UK. So we're really pleased to have you here today. We've got over 400 data specialists around the world to help you um, wherever your projects are managed. And so without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Nicolas. Thank you, Alison. So I'll get the camera and we can move on to uh, next slide. So data trends and use cases. Trend number one, change as a constant. Um, the recent crisis has shown that when a shock of that magnitude takes place, it is key to have the right data to assess the real situation of your company and to start elaborating scenarios to, uh, to adapt to it. If you're not equipped, it will be much more difficult for you to collect, to analyze data, to make timely and informed decisions. This is currently pushing companies and institutions to uh, rethink the way they operate fundamentally and how departments collaborate together. Trend two. Yeah, trend to data explosion. The volume of data of all sorts is still growing. Text, voice, uh, sounds, videos, images from drones, satellites, micro satellites, mobile, produced by uh, both humans and, uh, and machine continue to, uh, as, as we said, to grow at a very rapid pace. The raw data from all these sources should be refined to become intelligence and then that intelligence will become information that will be used for either actions or automations, producing results, and then it loops back again and again. Trend four, trend uh, third, this corresponds in fact to the decentralization of the intelligence all along the value chain. And this is a major change. More and more devices or applications integrate AI. And therefore, your company needs now to have a holistic view of these intelligences to best leverage them. Nonetheless, a central intelligence is still needed to pilot everything and to, uh, to stay in control. Of course, with this um, um, decentralized of intelligence and uh, the race of operations between business intelligence and the uh, overall intelligence makes that you need to have a direct impact on uh, you, every aspect of your value chain. Producing just reports nowadays become more and more useless. Trend four, real time and cloud. Of course, this is a direct correlation to what we saw before. The increase of connected humans and machine plus the need to have a direct impact on operation imply 
that you must be able to manage them in real time. So it will grow uh, fastly over time. Of course, to do so, the fastest approach is to leverage cloud resources and services because it becomes more and more costly to do that uh, on premises. So now I suggest, based on the, this general context, that we move to uh, three use cases. We saw uh, for two of them in different countries, and the second one is specific to uh, one of our countries. Case number one, so we're in the financial services sector and uh, there the main challenges were to break the bunkers or silos of data within the uh, financial institution in order to unleash the collective intelligence. Second challenge was to generate, of course, productivity gains because uh, we noticed that sometimes up to 30% of the time was dedicated to collecting, cleansing, preparing data before being in a position to analyze the, that data and to create intelligence. Of course, third challenge was to equip the institution with a new generation of data platform. Results, so we managed to build, depending on the country, a new hybrid cloud platform up and running within 12 to 15 months. Second, uh, it was possible then to build more uh, faster uh, a security. You, you can stay back here, yeah, thanks. To build a security master file to enrich the analytical capabilities of the financial institution for simulation, quantitative analysis, and also to have uh, a 360 degree view on positions and uh, transactions. Now we can move to case two. Mobility, uh, mobility transport. So there the challenges were to better match the offer and the demand of taxis in three railway stations in a European capital. Plus it was also a request from the uh, local authorities saying that uh, given the impact on the traffic, please make sure you, uh, you can do something to, to improve it. And of course, another challenge was to enrich the passenger experience arriving at the station. So what we did was to set up, design and deploy a new IoT uh, hybrid cloud platform. And then it was up and running within six months. The, another result was, of course, the ability to analyze very fast the taxi data, the Wi-Fi traces, and the fixed devices that were present in the station. So uh, doing that, we had more precision in calculating the waiting time. And also, uh, more important, the ability to direct upfront the different taxis within the city uh, to the right station. Again, uh, three uh, railway station were uh, in, uh, in the scope. Overall, this was the first step to uh, better understand the passengers' flaws in, uh, in these stations. K3. So we can move to, the, yeah. Energy utility sector, <clears throat> very interesting sector, uh, currently experiencing major transformation from a traditional, if I take electricity, one way uh, logic. You know, you are, there is the production the transformation, the distribution and commercialization. And now, as you can see in the little schema uh, below, you've got all sorts of energy sources. You've got circular uh, uh, communities where you can be both a producer and a consumer. And this uh, is bringing new challenges. So there, the idea was to support the deployment of smart meters all along the network which is a regulatory obligation in, uh, in many countries, different time frame, and to turn that regulatory obligation into a business opportunity. Of course, doing so, and because you've got a B2C customers, you need to ensure compliance with data privacy. Results, new hybrid uh, cloud data platform, again, uh, up and running in, uh, in 12, 15 months. That's a, a bit the... Uh, time frame needed to, to do things right. A 360 degree view on the smart meters network. So this is enabling uh, the uh, operator to have a better operational efficiency of all the teams 
supervising, organizing, maintaining the network, and also to uh, better understand the B2C and the B2B usage uh, around uh, their customer base with a much more fine-grained analysis. And also this is the foundation for the design of new products and, and services. Of course, the ability uh, through time, once this platform is on air, to integrate new business needs with much more uh, flexibility and much more rapidly. This is it for, for the uh, initial part and the use cases. Now I suggest we go a bit more technical uh, with Ibrahim and see uh, what's the primary behind all that and uh, what are the different options. Again, this is uh, another view, pretty rich, but uh, interesting. Ibrahim? Thank you, Nicola. Uh, so I will uh, now walk you through five different big data architectures based on Microsoft Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform. And then we will talk about Snowflake and Cloudera data platform. So we'll start with the Azure uh, platform. As you will see, the presentation of the main building blocks followed the same logic in order to better compare them. So I'm only presenting a part of all the ecosystem for each solution. I'm not presenting all the solution proposed by, by each uh, provi cloud provider. In this slide, we have an overview of the different Azure Analytics services that we can use to build a data platform. On the left, we have the block, block one, data sources. Uh, data can be in different formats, different types, and from very heterogeneous sources like real-time data from IoT uh, devices, from web services, raw data, raw data, or direct access from external databases. It can be structured or unstructured data. Then we go to the right, to the block seven. We have the data visualization and reporting tools, uh, like Power BI, Tableau, or Click. In block eight, we have business intelligence applications that are, that will access the data for an operation purpose via different formats and protocols like XML, JSON, or CSV. You can note that uh, an application can be both a source and a target. We can also use standard connectors like GBC, GDBC or ODBC connectors or via API, API access to get access to the data or direct and direct access to warehouses, for example. Let's go back to the block two, the creation part for the collection and ingestion. We find different integration tools like IoT hubs, uh, which use to collect data from devices using standard IoT protocols like MQTT protocol. This service is fully scalable to manage millions of devices. Event hub, it is used to collect real-time real even data from different systems. For sure, all services of the, of the cloud are fully scalable and are on pay-as-you-use mode. Uh, then we have function apps, which used to deploy custom functions in different languages like C Sharp, Java, .NET. The cloud infrastructure provides the compute power that we need to run our functions automatically. Then we have uh, an example of ETL tool, extract transform load tool, which is data factory, where we can extract data from different data sources with, with different formats and load it to the platform. We always in big data, data and data architecture to use ELT data management mode to fully benefit from the computing power of the platform without slowing down the data consumption. Then all the data that we collect will be will land in block six, the primary storage data lake uh, for long-term persistent storage in Azure Blob storage or Azure Data Lake storage. All services in the cloud for Azure, Amazon, or Google can be easily connected. For example, when a new, a new message arrives in the event hub, a function can be launched automatically. We move to the block three, where we have all big data and real-time processing and data science tools for artificial intelligence and machine learning. We start by stream analytics, which used to analyze, process fast data, and trigger actions and alerts. 
It can also su supply uh, computed data to other systems. Another example is Databricks, which is an Apache Spark based analytics platform. With Databricks, we can manage streamlined workflows and big data batch calculations in fast way. Uh, with Spark SQL, uh, we can use data frames to work easily on structured data and MLlib uh, libraries where we have all common learning algorithm and utilities to analyze data. For instance, we have uh, libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Keras. <clears throat> we move then to block four, um, where we can find uh, real-time databases and warehouses. We start by Synapse Analytics. Synapse Analytics is a, the new version of SQL Data Warehouse, now in public preview. It's not, it brings together enterprise data warehousing and big data analytics where we can query data in with SQL on demand or using embedded Spark tools. Uh, this Synapse Analytics is a complete end-to-end -end analytics solution with integration of Azure Machine Learning and Power BI. The second database is uh, Cosmos DB. That's a Microsoft distributed mighty model database. It offers uh, low latency queries, so less than 10 milliseconds for all data volumes. It offers high availability for critical applications with 99.9999% uh, availability and consistency. The third uh, component is analysis services. It is an analytical data engine to create all app cubes. That is a big advantage of Azure cloud computing comparing uh, to other data platforms. We finished with, with the block five for uh, the block uh, that concerned cost security, governance, lineage, and data platform administration. All the services in Azure Cloud are protected using a collection of security and govern governance and administration tools. Uh, here we have just a sample of the various security components that protect client services and data. Let's move now to the second architecture the Amazon AWS architecture. In this schema, we find the same building blocks, like the first slide. Uh, we have at the left data sources, and at the right, we have all the applications that will consume data. We added in block seven, for instance, QuickSight. QuickSight is a, an Amazon service, a fully managed, managed service. Uh, with, um, which can be used to create and publish interactive dashboard and reports. We come back to block two, the creation block. Uh, we start with AWS IoT Core uh, that can make it possible to connect easily and securely billions of devices to the cloud applications. It can manage trillions of messages. And this service is the equivalent of IoT Hub in Microsoft Azure Cloud. Then we have as um, then we have uh, IWS Glue, which are NTL services that make it easy to, for customers to prepare and load their data for analytics. We can create and run HL job uh, with a few clicks in the IWS management console. And like Azure Functions, we have AWS Lambda to run code without provisioning or managing servers. Uh, we pay only for the compute time, so we pay only for, for what we use. And this uh, Lambda uh, component can be launched using triggers uh, coming from other components. We finish with uh, Amazon MSK uh, that make it possible to build our application that use Apache Kafka to process streaming data. Then we move to the primary storage part. So all the collected data is stored in Amazon S3 storage system. We have uh, two types of um, archive data that can be stored in S3, in S3 Glacier or SC Glacier Deep Archive, depending on the, the data. Then in block three, we have all big data and stream analytic analysis tools and data science, like SageMaker, um, which make it possible to build, run, and deploy machine learning models. It gives all the utilities to evaluate the algorithm and to detect problems. 
for instance. Then Amazon EMR, which is a big data platform for processing vast amounts of data using uh, open source such as Apache Spark, uh, Apache HBase, or Apache Hive. Uh, with with the EMR, we can run petabyte scale analysis and can be like uh, half of the cost of traditional of, of traditional traditional open on-premises platforms. Then uh, Amazon Kinesis, uh, where we can collect, process, and analyze real-time streaming data. So um, Amazon Kinesis can be uh, between the block two and block three because we can collect and then uh, process real-time data. Okay. We move uh, forward to block four where we find the, all the real-time databases and uh, data warehouses. DynamoDB is a key value and document database that delivers less than 10 millisecond performance at any scale. DynamoDB can handle more than 10 trillion requests per day and can support peak of more than 20 million requests per second. Another product is Red, uh, Amazon Redshift which is a petabyte scale data warehouse service. We can start just a few hundred gigabytes of data and scale it up uh, until several petabytes or more. It's like it's equivalent of uh, Azure SQL data warehouse today. As for Azure Cloud, AWS provides all the standard connectors to connect with the services of the platform, as we see in the block, um, the, the, the application. All the services are secured using a wide list of security and administration utilities to protect the data and services, as we can see in block uh, five. Now we will go um, to the Google Cloud uh, data platform architecture, which is the third uh, architecture. Next slide. We still have the same building blocks as as, as IWS and um, Azure, we have the same data sources, the same applications. In block seven, we added Looker, uh, which is an enterprise platform for business intelligence, data applications, and embedded analytics. It was acquired by Google Cloud Platform in uh, 2019. We move back to block two for in the integration tools part where we can build highly scalable application with App Engine, uh, which is a fully managed serviceless platform like uh, Azure Functions and AWS Lambda. With the App Engine, we can build quickly uh, and deploy application using many of the popular languages like PHP, Java, Python, or .NET. The second service is published subscribe uh, component. Uh, to uh, real to to manage uh, real time messaging uh, that arrive to the platform. Uh, it's as equivalent of uh, IoT Hub in Azure and IoT Core in AWS. Then uh, Cloud Data Fusion. It's a real messaging service to send or receive messages between independent applications. It's the equivalent to the service of IoT Hub in Azure and IoT Core in AWS. All the collected data are then stored in Block 6, in the primary storage, uh, which is uh, Google Cloud Storage, Google, Google Platform. Uh, this storage is unified, scalable, and highly durable object storage. It offers different pricing levels, like standard, archive, or cold line. Um, we move forward to block three. I uh, um, uh, act, uh, artificial intelligence platform make it easy for machine learning developer, data scientists, and data engineers to make their machine learning projects from development to production and deployment, and to deploy it quickly and uh, cost effective and cost effective. Sorry. The Artificial intelligence, intelligence platform in Google supports uh, Kubeflow. That's a Google open source platform. We have then Google Data Preparation, with, with, uh, which is an intelligent cloud data service to visually explore, clean, and prepare data for analysis and machine learning. 
We have data flow, which an, an unified stream and batch processing tool. It is, it is serverless, fast, and cost effective. We move to block four then, where we can find the real time and the data warehouse databases. We have Cloud Big Table, it's a Google NoSQL Big Data database service. It's the same database and, uh, that powers many Google services like uh, Maps and Gmail. Then we have BigQuery database. database. Uh, with with the BigQuery uh, machine learning, uh, we can do data science uh, computation, data analysis to build and uh, personalize machine learning models directly inside BigQuery using simple SQL. With BigQuery uh, BI Business Intelligence Engine, uh, we can do fast in-memory analysis uh, to allow users to analyze large and complex data sets interactively. We have also Cloud Spanner, uh, which is a fully managed relational database service that offers uh, transaction, transactional consistency, but at uh, global scale. Uh, like uh, AWS and uh, Azure, all Google Cloud services are protected with, uh, with a wide catalog of security applications, as we can see in Block 5. Now we will go to the Cloudera architecture. Here it's a little bit different from the, what we saw in AWS, Google, and, uh, Amazon, Google and uh, Amazon. Sorry. Cloudera Data Platform is a new data platform proposed by Cloudera after the merge between Cloudera and Hortonworks. I know it already. The platform combines the best from Cloudera Enterprise Data Hub and Hortonworks Data Platform Enterprise, along with new features. Today, Cloudera is the leader of the data on-premise platform based on open source Apache Hadoop technologies. Cloudera Data Platform can be installed on uh, cloud, Amazon, and uh, Azure today, not available on Google Cloud today. Can be installed on hybrid mode or on premise uh, environment. Using Cloudera SDX, uh, we can manage our cluster in different regions and, clou uh, and cloud providers. We can create a dedicated cluster, for example, for data, one other cluster for analytics, and third one for data science and connect all these uh, three clusters to, together. We start with the block two, the ingestion integration part. Uh, we can use Apache Li-Fi for, for data integration. We can use Scoop for transferring data between Hadoop file system and structured and rational databases. We can use Kafka for handling, handling real-time low latency data fields. Uh, Kafka is high available and scalable. Kafka can use can be used to to connect to external system like uh, external databases via Kafka Connect. We can also use Apache Flume, which is distributed, reliable, and available services to collect data uh, and a large amount of data from log files. One more one more time, I'm just presenting a part of all the other system all. The ecosystem of Cloudera and the other cloud providers are not presenting all the, the components. Uh, the collected data is then uh, stored in the primary storage, block six. We use uh, Apache Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS. HDFS is used by Hadoop applications to store big data volumes. Uh, HDFS creates multiple replicas of the same data in blocks. And distributed them and distribute them um, on compute hosts uh, to enable extremely rapid computations. Then in block three, the big data and real-time processing block, we have Apache Spark, which is a fast and, and uh, general purpose cluster computation system. It also supports a rich set of high-level tools, including Spark SQL for SQL and structured data processing. MLLib for machine learning uh, algorithm and Spark streaming for low latency stream processing on big volumes of data. We move forward to the to block four. We start with Hive, Apache Hive, 
which is a data, wa data warehouse system that offers a SQL-like language called HiveQL. Using Hive, we can model our database warehouse. We can create metadata from raw files stored in HDFS, and we can use SQL queries to access data. Then Apache, uh, and then uh, Apache Impala, which is, was a Cloudera product at, at the beginning. Impala is an, a massive prior processing SQL engine to query raw data with very low latency on big data volumes. Impala uses Hive metadata to access HDFS data. The third database is Apache HBase. It's a run, it's a random real-time uh, read access data to for large data sets. It's a no SQL column oriented database and it's it's used for hosting very, very large tables, billions of rows and millions of columns. And we finish with the block four, where we, we use Apache Atlas and uh, to, uh, to edit and manage the, the governance of the cluster and Apache Ranger to manage find access rights to files and databases. We move uh, next to the, to the next architecture is the, the Snowflake architecture. Snowflake, it's a cloud-based solution which is uh, having a huge traction at the moment. It can be hosted on AWS, Azure, and uh, in 20, 2020, we can, it can be hosted in uh, Google Cloud Platform. As we can see in the storage block, the storage, uh, the storage block six, we can directly query data in AWS, Azure Block Storage, or Google with Snowflake. As we can see in the schema, uh, Snowflake is used in combination with other cloud and hybrid services for integration, machine learning, and real-time stream processing. And Snowflake proposed all the standard connects to, to access databases and to, to, to external access to the Snowflake data, data. If we move to the next slide, we'll see all the Snowflake layers. Next slide. In this slide, we see, we, we, we see all these Snowflake layers. Snowflake uses a centralized storage with independent uh, warehouses for computations. computation. The virtual warehouse provides resources, including memory and CPU, to perform the SQL executions. The storage is scalable infinitely. You can have one gigabyte and uh, some hundred of uh, terabytes or petabytes. The data is organized in cloud optimized compressed columnar format storage. A data warehouse is an independent compute cluster that does, that does not share compute resources with other warehouses. So each virtual warehouse has no impact on the performance of other virtual warehouses. For example, we can create a dedicated warehouse for data loading, another warehouse for data science access, and the third one for analytics. We can scale compute resources up and down as needed from X small to 4X large compute nodes. And with, with the Snowflake architecture, we have high available architecture and the instances are fully distributed across multiple Amazon, Azure, and Google availability zones. Snowflake is uh, secure by design, so all data is encrypted over the internet and on disks. And we can query with Snowflake both structured and semi-structured semi data like JSON, Avro, or XML uh, using it simple SQL operators and with the performance that is very close to structured data. Thank you for listening. It was very pretty dense, so I hope I didn't lose you. And now handing over to Nicola. Thank you, Ibrahim. So yeah, maybe the next line, Jan. To sum up, yeah, it was pretty dense running through uh, very quickly an overview of all these tech architecture, of course, many more uh, 
complexity behind. We are, we are trying to abstract and go to, to the essential. Key success factors. The first one is, of course, any of these transformation projects must not be justified only by technical aspect. The number one key success factor is when all clients have a strong business centricity in this project. We saw that in the uh, introduction part. This must have a, a clear and demonstrated impact on your business model and operation. So you need to be very clear on what you want to do, what you want to do differently from what you're currently doing, being customer facing activities, supply chain, manufacturing, depending on your uh, industry or the way you currently manage your investment, if you're an asset manager, for instance. Second, um, a robust technical vision. As you saw, there is plenty, plenty of options, and they're all pretty uh, robust at the, at the moment. So you need to forge your vision based on where you want to go, plus the legacy you are bringing with you and how you want to transform it. So uh, key success factor, you know, go rapidly testing, trying, and have an iterative execution, no grandiose plan, one year and a half, and we'll see uh, at the end. So try to have, you know, every uh, three, four months, major elements delivered, tested in your execution plan. Fourth, uh, proof of value versus proof of concept. So this is again a correlation with point one. You're not proving a technical concept, it can be part of the transformation. But what you're looking for is how you are currently having an impact on the value of total or parts of the value chain of your uh, company or public institution. So I think this is it for um, the wrap up for the tech session. Maybe, uh, Alison, we can move to the question as time is running. Yeah. So I suggest we all come back and join our participants for the Q&A session. We've had quite a few questions. Um, the first one I would put to you is, do all cloud platforms propose a data center in Switzerland? Uh, yeah, very uh, hot topic when you're in Switzerland. So currently, Microsoft Azure and uh, Google Cloud propose availability zones in Switzerland. So Microsoft has put a strong investment. So they have two zones, South and North, and Google on the North in Zurich. More broadly, all providers uh, currently have a release plan of uh, new availability zones. For instance, you could take Spain, uh, Amazon, and Google plan to open Spain in 2022-23. So you can uh, have this information available. After when they open, does not mean they have all services. We saw that with uh, Azure. So there is a kind of lineup of services available. They start with the uh, core one, infra one, and after they, they release different services. So this is something to, uh, to closely look at. Okay, and then there were a few questions about advantages and disadvantages. In your opinion, which cloud provider is the best when it comes to data services? I'm going to take this question. I think there is not a clear cut answer to that question. Really, really, I can don't, don't have a really an answer to, for that. They all have now a full suite of uh, core data services uh, at a very good level and serve prestigious clients, very big clients today. Uh, Amazon, AWS with uh, Redshift uh, based way back in 2013. Uh, to a new generation of data platforms. Today, the majority of investment on the cloud are on the cloud, for sure. Look at Snowflake, for example, it's 1.4 million USD raised uh, recently. Yeah, correct. And uh, reminds me of an, an anecdote. When uh, Amazon launched Redshift, it was a bit to fight against the uh, on-prem uh, uh, giants, SAP, Oracle, etc. So Redshift means shift away from Oracle because the logo uh, is still uh, red. And so um, I'm not sure it eased the relationship between the two. And we saw years ago Larry Ellison uh, fighting uh, hard on, on Amazon. So yeah, the, the move is, uh, is drastic to, to the cloud. And companies like Oracle and SAP are currently trying to catch up and come back in the race. 
doing uh, some significant investments. So we'll see the, the results. Again, no one fits all uh, answer for, for that. It really depends on uh, uh, where you want to go. Big names in each uh, cloud provider. So it, it needs to be analyzed. Yeah. OK, I think we have time maybe for um, to pick up one question that's come up in a few different ways in the, the question part of the platform. Um, what is the best way to get started? Um, I think the best way is to have a very short term. If you're starting from, from scratch, uh, select maybe two, three use cases with a high impact on, on your company. And then try to model them and test them on two to three cloud platforms. You can have, a, a, as you saw, a mix of technology depending on what you can uh, you can afford. And after a debrief, and then build your more uh, ambitious plan. And and again, but with uh, some flexibility, be agile, and also with strong iteration. But no more than four months to do that. So deliver very quickly. Bring the business with you. Uh, it will be part of the cloud adoption process also and see uh, you know what you can you can do the powerful technical aspect and the business impact all together in a that's a proof of value of, of four months that's the best way I think I think we're coming to the end of our webinar um, we still have some questions that are coming through. What we're going to do afterwards is we'll review the pending questions and answer them. So thank you for watching and thank you for asking your questions. Keep in touch with us to um, continue the discussion. Uh, to answer one more question, yes, the today's session has been recorded. So shortly after the end of the webinar, we'll be sending you a link to the recording with the slides. Um, there's also a link to a survey. Thank you for taking the time to, to give us some feedback. It helps us to improve our client events and to make sure that we're engaging with you on topics that you're interested in. Um, so thanks again, and we hope to see you again real soon for a Talon webinar. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.